CGTN, China Global Television Network. island of Mauritius, nestled in the Indian Ocean, emerged after an underwater volcanic eruption about 8 million years ago. This unspoiled paradise, without an indigenous human population, was colonized by the Dutch in 1638, the French in 1715, and the British in 1810. With the colonials came slaves from Africa and indentured laborers from India and China, who in turn brought to the island their languages, religions, traditions, and foods. By the time of political independence in 1968, Mauritius had already developed its unique melting pot characteristics. Here, Creole, French, and English are all spoken by just about every local Mauritian. And new immigrants keep coming from all over the world, adding their unique contributions to this dynamic and vibrant melting pot. On this special episode of Talk Africa, filmed on location in Mauritius, we'll introduce you to an eclectic mix of local islanders. Their collective voice echoes what it means to be Mauritian today. I am Liu Feifei. Welcome to Talk Africa. In Mauritius, Chinese New Year is marked as a national holiday as an indication of the significant presence of Chinese culture on the island. Today, not only have the descendants of early Chinese settlers integrated into Mauritian society, but practices such as traditional Chinese medicine have also taken root. In the first part of this episode, we get to meet Mr. Vincent Achuan, whose father, Sir Jean Etienne Moulin Achuan, appears on the 25 rupees Mauritian banknote for his many outstanding contributions to Mauritius. And later, we learn about how the practice of traditional Chinese medicine is gaining ground in Mauritius. Let's take a look. About 3% of the population in Mauritius is of ethnic Chinese heritage. Among them is the prominent Atrin family, whose roots on the island go back over 120 years ago. I get to meet with Vincent Atrin, who is a third generation member of this distinguished Sino-Mauritian family. Together, we'll explore his family's rich history on the island at their former family residence in Rose Hill, which today serves as a museum to honor his illustrious grandfather. Hi, Vincent. Thank you so much for taking time to speak with us. I know you're a very busy man. Um, where do I start? My goodness, it's hard to walk around Mauritius and not look into the shop of a bookstore and not see this amazing book, which is uh, called Chinatown in the Heart of Mauritius. And your family features very heavily in this book. Tell us about how the first Atrin came to Mauritius and when that was. Yes. Uh, that's a long time ago. It was uh, 1890. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, at that time, China was in a very uh, poor state, and most of the Chinese were emigrating, finding old jobs elsewhere. So he was amongst, amongst those who uh, decided to come to this uh, part of the world. That is, at that time in China, from what we have been told, there were two gold mountains, okay? One San Francisco, the other one is Johannesburg. So all the Chinese were, they said, the gold, the, the gold mountain will get jobs. So you just go there to get jobs. They don't know which type of job they will get. So there are some who went, many who went to San Francisco, to, to, to America, and many came to Africa. But before arriving in Africa, you have to stop over in Mauritius. So many of them, maybe after one and a half months of, you know, say, in, at that time it was sail ship, they might have been very tired. So they found that the island was nice. So 
he was amongst them who decided to stay in Mauritius. When he landed, he wanted to go to the gold mound in, in Johannesburg. Yeah. How was it that he ended up staying here and putting roots down in Mauritius? In fact, a lot of those Chinese sojourners wanted to return back to China after they've made the money. That How was, did he put down roots in Mauritius? That, that, well, that was, the, that was the objective of these Chinese who came to Mauritius and Reunion and, other, and South Africa was that they would come and make money and then uh, send the money back to, uh, to, 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 to China and build a house and start maybe another, uh, a new business there. That was their objective. But uh, the history, history changed a lot of things. There were the, there were the Sino-Japanese war, you know, the, when the Japan invaded China. Yes. Okay. So, and then you had the Second World War. So all this, I think he decided that it's better we stay here. <laughs> Why not? And, and the original Mr. Atrin, your grandfather, what kind of life did he find here? And what, what kind of trade did he engage in? He came as a laborer, but he eventually yes. developed a business. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, most, of the, most of the first comers, when they come here, is that because those who have come here first may have started a uh, lo local retail shop. And you know, Chinese are very good traders. Mm. So once the business grow, they ask their friends or their relatives to come. And this is how my grandfather landed here. Maybe he started to work as a, as a cook because you know, food is very important. Very important the, to the Chinese. For those who have got money, they have to uh, get good food. And to, those who don't have money still need to <laughs> yes, eat. Exactly. So food is important. But they can afford to import one. Okay. That, that, is, that was the tradition, you see. So, and then a few years later, he was very lucky. He got a small shop in one of the old sugar states, which is closed now, called the Mount, which is close to the, which is about 10 minutes uh, from Pam Promises Garden, you know. At that time, the, this uh, Campus Garden was very, uh, very important landmark in, in Mauritius, and he, and there was a lot of um, sugarcane plantation there. So he had a shop in a sugarcane factory, just at the gate of the sugar factory. So he was very, very lucky. Soon he was being recognized by the Mauritian government exactly. and he held one of the first uh, government yeah. posts by a Chinese person yeah. here. Tell us, tell us about that. Yeah, as I said, he was very uh, active. He was the youngest president of the Chinese Chamber of Commerce. He's been president for seven, seven years. And so uh, because of the war, as I said, there was a need for rationing for, you know, in case because in case there the was food short. supply no, ran out. Yeah. Food, su food supply was already short. So some poorer people, the government had to ensure that they can get some food. So there was an issuance of food ration. In fact, your father is widely recognized so as the man who So this is how he helped the, the government eating during to make that sure time. that the Chinese traders collaborated with the government to give the... the, 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 the the foods to the to the to the people in the rural areas, especially. Yes. I, I I think it's such an honor. Um, you gave me this yes. earlier, but in fact, uh, for our viewers, um, maybe they can have a look. This is the twenty-five yes. rupee yes. for Mauritius, and th there he is, yes. um, Mr. Atwin uh, Senior, Sir Jean Moulin Atwin. At some point, he was actually knighted by yeah. the British government. How but did that come about? Well, I think uh, after 21 years of political, you know, contribution service, service he was knighted by the Queen. He, he went to the Buckingham Palace. And I think the ripple effect of what he did is not only achieved in his own lifetime, but what he left behind. There are Chinese, well, people of Chinese heritage in different government positions as judges. And you, you have taken over the family business, you are the president of the ABC Group, which you mentioned earlier. But in fact, this is a large organization with business across many different sectors, automobile, banking, yeah. trade, and so forth. How do you feel that the Chinese 
descendants of the first Chinese sojourners to Mauritius have contributed to modern Mauritius today? Well, we are very proud. We always say, um, especially our parents, we, we have uh, contributed to build up the economy through the retail trade. And now even the, in the supermarkets, uh, I think 75% of the supermarkets are owned by the Chinese. But we have, uh, also, we have also uh, sort of uh, fully integrated in the, in, in, in the country's uh, economic uh, tissue. Uh, we are present in, uh, whether in civil, serv civil service, and in the industries, whether it's uh, uh, beside supermarkets, but in industries like textile factories, uh, stone crushing, transport, uh, chicken uh, farm, a lot of uh, diverse uh, industries in Mauritius. I think it shows our, uh, the Chinese, uh, Hard, hard working, <laughs> uh, sort of, uh, how do you say that, uh, habit. <laughs> For sure. And uh, success, you know, we are, we are always very motivated to, to, to be successful in our business, you see. Well, that's fantastic. Yes. I want to say thank you so okay. much, Vincent, no for all of your time. Uh, Indeed, the embrace of Mauritius has welcomed generations of immigrants from all over the world. And like the Atrans, they too have contributed to the island's DNA through their impact on Mauritian society, economy, and culture. Next, we cross over to ACU Care, a pain and rehab center in Eben, where modern conventional training in medicine meets traditional Chinese treatments. Dr. Pawan Gopal tells us about his center's unique blend of knowledge in healthcare that's drawing Mauritians to its doors. Dr. Gopal, I must say it's a little bit surprising to find a Mauritian doctor inside a traditional Chinese medicine clinic. How did you get started with this? Uh, uh, hello, Fefe. So first of all, after I, my A-level exams, I was offered a scholarship to China and I did nine years in China, one year of language, five years of uh, uh, pre-graduation, like you know, uh, undergraduate, and three years of post-graduation. During my study there in medicine, we deal both with Western medicine and traditional medicine. And after my undergraduate, I was working as an undergraduate doctor. And at that time, we see a lot of patients. So it's not like in Mauritius, like we give all kinds of medications to these patients. And we just start giving traditional medicine. So you so, practiced in China? Yes, for about four years. Where? I was in Guangxi, Nanning. Oh, and you were practicing both Western and Chinese medicine? You know, in fact, in China, we practice both. It's not like it's only this one or the other one. We do both of them at the same time. And when did you come back to Mauritius? I came back in 2015. And now I'm registered in the Medical Council of Mauritius as a Western practitioner. What, what kind of a practitioner are you? A general practitioner? Suppose you have a flu, you come to me, I give you antibiotics, painkillers, anti-inflammatories, I give you prescriptions. But you're also a neurosurgeon from what yes, I understand. I, I am a trained neurosurgeon and I did my training in neurosurgery, especially in neurovascular surgery. Wow, that's serious. What is the connection with neurovascular surgery and traditional Chinese medicine? You know, anything that concerns the neurons, the brain, we have a rehabilitation with that. And rehabilitation, it takes time. We cannot give any medication to speed up anything. So at that time, we have to, to take more help from traditional side to make the body more okay, more strong to deal with the problem. So that's when I became more uh, interactive with traditional medicine. Even when I was in China, we have rehabilitation centers and we have traditional centers. So they both come together with our treatment and we give them a package all together. I mean, what I think is really interesting about you is that, well, not only because I know you speak <laughs> fluent Mandarin, but also that you are a neurosurgeon. Um, a lot of Western practitioners, they say, oh, traditional Chinese medicine is not really proven, maybe it's not effective. Uh, what would you answer that? You know, in fact, lots of new data are coming, you know, because in medicine, we always talk about research. We take a group of people, we give one treatment, and we give another treatment to another group of people. Or two kinds of people, one want to do one treatment and not the other one, and we compare. 
lots of studies, yearly, monthly, daily, they are coming to, it, to say that acupuncture is helping in fibromyalgia, migraine, insomnia, and all kind of illness. So it's not me who is going to say that, but it's the studies that are saying that. So everyone is saying that traditional medicine is working. Are there instances where Western medicine is the way to go, and then are there other instances where Chinese medicine is definitely more effective? So for me, as a potential patient, how do I decide which route to go? This is the whole idea of this center, because you know I'm a Western practitioner, so I know everything, how we are going to deal with a patient. Suppose someone comes to me with one kind of a pain. I will give him medications, very probably anti-inflammatories to decrease the pain, but this is only, as we say in Chinese, it's only for the surface. But traditional medicine, we deal with the root. So together, we decrease the pain and we give traditional touch to it to take the whole body to another level. And it's working magic. Lots of people are very interested. Um, in fact, I want to ask you, I've been working so hard, I have a pain in my head. Okay. I don't know what kind of a pain it is. So How would you be able to help me? Let me see. From the traditional method, we have a palpation that we use three fingers in traditional medicine, usually one or two in Western medicine. And I can say you're very, you know, you're very weak. Maybe because you're not, you're not sleeping well, you're working too much, or maybe it's just the chronic fatigue that has accumulated. And, and what kind of treatment do you be able to So first of all, we will have to make you sleep properly. We can do some detox using some cupping, and then we can give you some acupuncture to give you more tea oh, in the body. Yeah. So it gives energy to the body. I need that. I need more chi so yeah. that I can be more powerful. So mo more than welcome. Yes, thank you so much. My conversation with Dr. Gopal ties in with the greater story of Mauritius. Here, the convergence of people and cultures has brought together a mix of different techniques in providing solutions for the modern day. We'll take a short break now, but don't go away. Talk Africa continues in a moment. China Global Television Network. From broadcast centers in Beijing, Washington, and Nairobi. A unique global perspective. Six channels and a video content service. News when you want it and where you want it. On TV screens, websites, mobile platforms, and social media. CGTN. See the difference. For this island nation, renowned for its scenic beauty, the environment ranks high amongst priorities for Mauritians. But rapid development in recent years has brought the challenges of pollution and climate change. And this is something that visionary Mauritians are tackling in their own unique ways. We first get to meet with Maxwell Ernest, a local environmental champion. Max, why is cleaning up the beach so important to you? Uh, because I grew up here and I live just uh, across the road here. You spent your whole life here? Yes, yes. I mean, I, I born here in the village called Samata. What's interesting in our learnings about Mauritius is that this was an island that was uninhibited before. It was just the dodos. Mm -hmm. So everyone, in a way, is an immigrant. When did your family come to Mauritius? I mean, it's been a generation, maybe 500 years. They've been coming by the ship here, and like a slave, coming from Africa, and bring by the ship here. And so, by definition, are you a Creole? Yes, I'm a Creole. Uh, I'm a Christian, we can say it like this. And yeah. What does that mean to be Creole? What is the Creole identity of Mauritius today? Uh, it's mean like it's, 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 the, it's the different of, uh, of, of, uh, of re religion. I mean, everybody have, they say, it, like I learned, they have a God. Yeah. And me, uh, we have Christians, it's mean Creole. And you have Muslim, you have Tamil, you have Chinese, but we all live nice together. But one problem you do have is with the rubbish yeah. and the pollution. Yeah. Um, compared to the north, uh, to you know, Grand Bay, mm -hmm. Port Louis, mm -hmm. this is still fairly pristine, mm -hmm. fairly untouched. So how and when did pollution become a problem here in the south? I mean, on the wild south, I can say it, and uh, it's since coming since 19 years ago. I mean, it's just when the development starts to come, you know, you have surface start to be becoming bigger, shops, 
all this and people always when they get something they need to have a plastic bag and you know it's it's everything coming together but I think that these people need as well of course everybody try to survive but they need to find another way to follow up as well to the nature part you know and so in fact the ocean is important to you for other reasons besides that it's just your passion it's actually a source of livelihood yes yes I mean I mean you can see from the dolphins you have a lot of activity what you can do you know we, are, we attract our customers our tourists to come in here to see our 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 part on on the south yeah. and it was interesting as we were walking down we saw a lot of even kids just fishing in the ocean i mean is that something people do like if i'm hungry i just yes, go yes. and catch a fish in the ocean yes i mean this what you just see it now i mean myself i like to do it because you know it's, it's just the feeling when you fish you know and and you take you cook your own fish you, you it's it's very really nice feeling i mean the fish uh, the kids is taking this like I hope for the next generation as well to still this traditional fishing is still stay is very important. So at this point, what do you think needs to happen here? How to mobilize the community and the government so that the ocean and the beaches are preserved? I think you know it's like for me I see it you know and the development you need to be as well socialized as well from all the community you know to to make things working better to make people understand things nicely maybe I don't know the governments can do this like I do I do training to learn people how how to do sport on the ocean you know maybe they can do things like this difference you know to 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 don't have this problem with trash you know this is our problem in the world now this trash you know so if people learn to love the ocean and respect it mm -hmm. then maybe they will stop polluting yeah this definitely i mean i mean some people you can see really like the ocean like you see this little kiss it's difficult to just pull him out and keep him in the middle of of the land you know and it's always going to come here you're going to like the ocean i mean this kids if you if you're explaining him how to 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 to, to cleaning the, the beach and all this stuff I mean, the kiss is going to keep this ocean clean. Sure. And I guess that is the future, Max. Thank you so much for speaking with us. We're off to meet more Mauritians. Someone else putting up a fight for the environment is Sharnaz Sobrati. She uses her works of art to raise awareness about coral reef preservation. I meet her at her studio, where art meets environmental activism. Sharnaz, thank you so much for chatting with us on Talk Africa. We're here in your studio surrounded by these beautiful creations. They look like coral, but looks are deceiving. They're actually not coral. Yes, they are actually artificial coral that we ma manufacture here in our workshop. They are made with uh, resin. And they are, the idea of all this is to pro protect our environment. So we, d we do this for the sustainable development in Mauritius. So I understand that you identify as a Mauritian, but everyone here is more or less an immigrant from some generations ago. Yes. Do you know the story of how your family came here and where they came from? So we are from Pakistan and India. We came, uh, our grandparents came here a long time ago to work in sugarcane fields, and that's how all this started. Now, is your family here in this area of Mauritius? I believe we're in Rose Hill. Yes, we're actually in Rose Hill. We, I live in Rose Hill. I am in a, actually, I rent a building in uh, Rose Hill from the Sunni mosque uh, of uh, Rose Hill. I find this very fascinating because as we were on our way over here, we passed a number of mosques, but right next to them, basically, there were also temples. Tell us about this unique neighborhood and how the different cultures and religions kind of interact. We have, in Mauritius, we have different cultures, but we all respect each other's. We do, so we are Mauritian, and Mauritian are well known to be very, like, we, are, we like each other, there's no problem living next to each other, we respect each other's religi religion, and that's great. We've walked through the island of Mauritius, it's absolutely gorgeous and stunning, uh, but it is facing some environmental challenges. What, what are some of those challenges, and then what is your solution to protect Mauritius? 
We do a lot of corals, we do other customized items with resin, with fiberglass, we do a lot of sculpture, we do a lot of molding. Uh, they, also, they, all the ideas is to do all this to, for the hotel development. We do a lot of interior decoration for hotels. We, lo we work a lot with interior designers. We work together for the better world in Mauritius. Thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you. Great pleasure for us. Well, I look forward to seeing some of the... Stemming from the colonial history of Mauritius, French culture still has a significant presence on the island today. And this cultural heritage is brought to life every day by Franco-Mauritians, who are the descendants of early French settlers to this island. Cécile Masson is one of them, and I get to chat with her at the waterfront in Port Louis. Hi, Cécile. Thank you so much for taking time to chat with us. I know that you're a busy lady. In fact, we are meeting here um, in this beautiful backdrop, which is your office. Yes, I'm lucky. I'm working for the biggest company of the island, which is uh, IBL. And uh, my, my uh, office is downstairs on the ground floor, just near Café Lux and near the sea. And in fact, you yourself are a member of the Franco-Mauritian community. You comprise just about 1% of the Mauritian population. Do you know how your ancestors came to be on Mauritius? Yes, actually, we were on the first batch of uh, French people coming here. So we are really uh, at the first beginning of the colony. And uh, my ancestor was uh, I don't know how to say that in English, artisan. Uh, he An was, artist? Uh, not artist. Uh, he, was, uh, he was someone who was um, uh, working with his hand. He was not an aristocrat. Huh? He was not, uh, we, we were not coming from a rich uh, French family. Uh, but we got the know-how. And uh, so it's, uh, my family is coming, uh, my name, family name is Masson. Masson. And, uh, and uh, yes, it's uh, really one of the oldest one in the, in the country. Um, but it's really funny because sometimes, you know, peop even Mauritian people ask me if I'm Mauritian. It's really, uh, it's really funny. Huh? So, are you Mauritian? Yes, I am. I, yeah, am I get asked that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am. Of course I am. So, uh, and I'm proud of it. I'm, uh, I'm proud to be a Mauritian. Um, yeah, you got parents from, Maurit from French, French, come on, Essence. And, uh, and you see also in the French community, a lot of people also get married to uh, uh, people outside the country because we are so small. And uh, so my father, uh, my mother is French. She's come from Paris. So my, my husband, uh, uh, his mother is uh, American. So you see, uh, um, so there's a lot of also uh, mix like this, not only from France, France, but uh, coming from outside a lot. I want to thank you, thank you. so much for taking time to talk to us. As this dynamic island paradise continues to attract and absorb peoples and cultures from all across the world. That's all we have time for this week on Talk Africa. A big thank you to all our guests on this special episode for sharing their insights. Remember to catch this and more episodes of Talk Africa on our YouTube playlist and the CGTN Africa website. We'd also love to hear your feedback through our social media handles on Facebook and Twitter. Do keep the conversation going and tune in again next week for more of Talk Africa. From me, Liu Feifei, and the team here in Mauritius, see you next time.